This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, my name's Tom Rath, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the conveners of the seminar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce Bill Booth, who's going to be talking today. Uh, Bill got his doctorate from the University of London in 2012, uh, wrote about the Mexican left. Um, and since then, he's been doing a number of different things, including organising the Radical Americas Network, uh, bringing up two uh, very uh, characterful young, young boys, uh, and also is currently teaching in the UCL History Department. Um, Bill today is going to talk to us, uh, give a paper which I think is a po uh, one part of a larger project on the transnational history of the, the left in Latin America in the early Cold War, which I... I take it as roughly the 1940s and 50s, although yeah. you'll tell us more about that. Um, I think it's fair to say this larger project Bill's working on is going to uh, stimulate a lot of interest. I say that not just because the room is full, but because last night uh, the eminent historian of the Mexican left, Barry Carr, was pestering me on Facebook uh, to get your email because he wanted to get in touch with you, purely on the strength of the, the abstract that I sent around. Um, so um, I think you are now in touch with him. Or, re-established contact. Um, now, of course, in the 1940s, unless we're in for a very, very big surprise, in the 1940s there was no Facebook, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, people did still manage to coordinate and connect across national borders in very interesting and important ways, um, which I think Bill is going to talk to us uh, today about. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Bill. And um, yeah. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure you sign the register. Thanks, Tom. Um, good evening. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've sat at another table many, many times, so it's very nice to be here. Um, mentioning Barry Carr, that was, um, yeah, you know, two o'clock this morning I had an email from him, uh, and, you know, he mentioned the fact that I'd, did he remember that I'd been around for dinner in Mexico with him in 2010 when I was doing my doctoral research, and um, how have things gone in the interim? Um, and actually, since I put out the abstract for this talk, I've had a flurry of emails from various people who are working at or around the fringes of this era, saying, you know, what's the, you know, is there a big idea? What's the, what's the, the linking thread? And this is the stage of the project where I'm starting to pull ideas together. Really, this is not a, um, a kind of authoritative intervention yet. This is a, this is a sketch of various ideas, so I'll, I'll talk about, about that a little bit more. Um, so the nature of this paper, I'd say, lies somewhere between a research report, a kind of preliminary investigations, a book proposal, which is something I'm working on at the moment, and a discussion document, because I'm, I'd really like to hear what people think about uh, these ideas. It's a sketch of a chapter uh, from a putative book, or even parts of a chapter, really, um, and before I describe it, I'll give a brief overview of this embryonic book project. Um, I'm at the early stages of putting together this synthetic book, a survey book, based largely on secondary sources, um, which would hopefully be pitched at a relatively broad readership, or at least as broad as you can imagine a readership would be for a kind of history of the left in the 1940s and 50s in Latin America, which might not be all that broad. Um, but bringing together histories of various strands of Latin American leftism during that period. Um, I think the broader motivation for this is this, what's now almost becoming a bit of a cliche that Latin America remains substantially overlooked during uh, the whole Cold War, with the exception of Cuba and the Cuban Revolution still, though this is changing, but in particular the Latin American left is seen as often quite absent with the exception of the Cuban narrative in that earlier part um, of the Cold War, and by which I'm, I really mean 1945 to 1949. Um, and while there has been a a concession in recent years to the importance of Guatemala and the coup of 1954, uh, there remains, I think, a broad narrative of lateness um, with regard to uh, the Latin American Cold War. Key volumes such as the recent Cambridge History of the Cold War uh, relegate pre-1959 Latin America to just a few paragraphs, really, and often and oddly, Latin America still gets lumped into broader narratives of decolonization. You know, there'll be there'll be a, a bunch of stuff in South Asia, a bunch of stuff on Africa, and then this is what happened at the same time in Latin America. And it's not necessarily a methodological um, coherence. 
Similarly, popular conceptions of the history of this period, um, we might think about recent volumes such as Ian Baruma's Year Zero, History of 1945, or Victor Sebastian's 1946. Um, there are other books that aren't just the names of years. Um, omit the southern half of the Western Hemisphere pretty much altogether, um, perpetuating the idea that the Cold War simply wasn't happening there yet. Um, while there is a good deal on the lineage of Marxist ideology which ran from Europe to the Americas uh, once the Cuban Revolution allied itself to the USSR, there is little which traces the longer history of radical leftisms which had previously developed in the region. Um, and here there is a bit of a disparity between histories of political theory um, and of political practice because there's some very well-known edited volumes bringing together examples of diverse Latin American leftist thought, you know, thinking of Luis Aguilar or Sheldon Liss most obviously, um, and in terms of some specific forms of leftist political practice, um, Rolly Popino's History of International Communism in Latin America addresses one strand of that, but more generalist texts don't tend to. Um, two re recent authoritative histories of global communism, uh, David Priestland's The Red Flag and Archie Brown's The Rise and Fall of Communism, so recent, they were recent when I started my PhD, they're now almost ten years old. Um, mention Latin America as a site of exile for communists um, from elsewhere, um, such as Trotsky in Mexico, and Priestland engages in a welcome discussion of the contemporary left in the context of longer histories of communism, um, but there is a need to look further back within Latin America, I think. Um, and as I said, Cuba is the glaring exception. You know, Cuban communism has been done and done and done, um, and still people find new and exciting ways to look at it, but I think tying it into wider regional narratives is is an important um, venture. Now, many of the intellectual traditions, um, organisational experiments, strategic decisions and political alliances that feed in to um, the apertura of 59 to 61, um, opening up of the Cuban revolutionary possibility, uh, were firmly rooted in the preceding decades. And I think that's true for other Latin American uh, movements in the 1960s as well. Um, Though Bethel and Roxburgh's edited volume, Latin America Between the Second World War and the Cold War, and also Chase Travels, edited by Paolo, uh, offer important insights into phases of political conflict in the re region, uh, this project seeks specifically to foreground the left. Um, and in these 15 apparently stable years, Latin America witnessed radical nationalist reform and revolution, armed agrarian uprisings, um, bitter rearguard labour action, as well as some formative personal ideological journeys, um, Castro, Fonseca, Torres, Cabanas, and so on. And though there's a strong literature on the pre-1945 period, and Daniela Spencer's obviously been a great influence on me on the Comintern in Latin America, and post-59, um, and Nicola Miller on Soviet Latin America relations, etc., and Barry, as you mentioned, on, on the, the country narrative of Mexico, uh, I think still there's a significant need for an overview of the left in the intervening years on a whole region-wide basis, but, and possibly at quite a, a broad level, admittedly. Um, why does this period matter? Um, for many reasons, obviously, and I'll have to justify my existence when I formulate the book proposal, but I lay out in the structural framework of my doctoral thesis, um, which is intended to form the opening section of the book, this idea that the period 1945 to 1947 is, is quite a crucial global conjuncture, um, representing a transition from one set of social, economic and political norms to a new framework, and you know, this is not wildly controversial. Um, but I think restating that this is no less true for Latin America than it is for Europe is important. Um, and more more so for sections of the left which failed to appreciate that this was now a Cold War reality. I think this is, a, this is quite an important part of Latin American leftism that uh, certainly in Mexico but also in other parts of Latin America there is still a lasting popular front mentality um, rather than a switch to a, a, a Cold War uh, reformulation of not necessarily just communist, anti-communist relations, uh, conflicts but more general left-right um, statist versus market although obviously market rhetoric is often uh, disguising various forms of statism in Latin America at this point too. Um, this links into the second reason for the period's importance, um, and it, I think it was as Grandin has amply demonstrated Empire's workshop, a uh, testbed for the tactics used by the United States 
and its allies to combat not only pro-Soviet, but also non-aligned radicalisms in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and a lot of that process begins in the, in the 1940s and 1950s, albeit in a, in a haphazard and not necessarily formulaic uh, way quite yet. So I'll present the left not only as agents of political radicalism, but also as subjects of extrajudicial killing, kidnapping, propaganda attacks, and dirty war sort of avant la lettre. Alejandra Bronfman, writing about Cuba, has suggested that even as they are relatively neglected, the 1950s fit into explanatory schemes as the before in what Oscar Zanetti refers to as before and after history. So read through a lens of the impending revolution. And I think if you substitute revival or rebirth for revolution in that sentence, you can broadly speaking get to the case for histories of the Latin American left more generally. Um, so in Mexico, the MLN arrives dramatically, and for the left, the 1950s are the, the barren before, and then we look back to see where the MLN came from um, in the 1950s. But as Aaron Coy Moulton has shown with regard to the Circum-Caribbean region, if we dig below the before and after narrative, we find continuity, we find renewal, we find reconfiguration, rather than kind of break. So the book idea um, is planned to comprise nine chapters, so conjunctural bookends, and then thematic looks at different parts of the left. Um, Pro-Soviet communists, the state when directed by leftists, dissident communists, campesinos where, where radical and leftist, liberation theologists and guerrillas, artists and thinkers, and those in exile or diaspora. Um, and in this paper, relates to the final chapter, the exile and diaspora. So I'll examine some of the interactions between internationalist leftism, transnational activism and identity, uh, and progressive nationalism, or left nationalism in early Cold War Latin America. Um, rather galloping, I'm afraid, through three case studies. Puerto Rican revolutionary nationalism, uh, Mexican workers on either side of the US border, and assorted non-Mexican leftists in Mexico. Um, you know, these are examples drawn from any number of possibilities at this stage. It will therefore touch on some key sites of transnational organisation and activism as well as important examples of leftists in exile. Um, perhaps the beginnings of the emergence of a wider Latino identity, political identity, um, and the redefinition of US imperialism in a Cold War context. Recently, I was giving a lecture about the Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire, um, and I spoke to the students about the transmission of the name Tupac from Amaru I to Amaru II and Qatari, and then much later to several of the Black Panthers and thence to Tupac Shakur, undoubtedly the best known Tupac these days, though possibly not in these august surroundings. Um, similarly, I was wondering who would come to mind when we say Chavez today. Um, surely it's Hugo rather than Cesar. Um, while Lebron suggests six foot eight of Cleveland Cavalier rather than a Lolita attacking Congress with a handgun. Some identities from this period, of course, do remain, you know, Neruda, Che, Castro, identities all surviving intact. I'm not sure Raoul's done much rapprochement notwithstanding to displace Fidel from the public mind quite yet. Um, but many of those active on the Latin American left in the 40s and 50s have faded from view outside their national milieu. Their names half forgotten, <coughs> not kept warm by a basketball star or a president, uh, Mauricio Grabois, Ruben Jaramillo, Jose Revueltas, Esther Chapa, many more. Um, and it's in this foggy period then between more or less the Chapultepec Conference of 1945 and the Cuban Revolution of 1959, uh, rather, which for historians of the left, I think, uh, necessitates a closer look, and I'm proposing to do that. Sandwich, sandwiched between the sort of bumptious, abrasive, earthy populisms of the 1930s and the post-1961 explosion of multiple revolutionary tendencies, um, often quite new and exciting for theorists who have come from a European tradition in that period as well, the late 40s and 50s are often characterised by an absence. Um, so onto this, this paper then. This paper wears the, the trans in transnationalism, if not lightly, then at least with caveats, um, hence the parentheses. In fact, what I suppose I'm positing is a period in which both political networks and identities traversed the boundaries implied by the separation of the nationalist, the internationalist, and the transnational. Um, you know, Puerto Rico is obviously a special case here because the national was the very contested point in, in this period. Um, Puerto Rican nationalism 
in some sense, was informed by diasporic life in the US metropolis um, and chose to attack US power in its own capital. Mexican workers transplanted um, to the United States in service of labour-hungry US capital working in formerly Mexican territory, laying the foundations for future Mexican-American and Chicano identities. And Cuban socialists and nationalists interacting, reconciling, planning for revolution in the Mexican hub of exile. Um, so on to the Puerto Rican case then. Um, Margaret Power has examined the relationship between Puerto Rican nationalists who conceived of themselves and their country in a wider Latin American terms. And it's perhaps possible to see them as quite early adopters of the political Latin American identity in that sense. Um, the relationship between they and the Latin Americans acting in solidarity um, with the nationalists, and perhaps there's a, a reflective identity development there. While the popularity of nationalism was more evident in the 1920s and 1930s in Puerto Rico, Power suggests that it was during this phase that roots were set down for longer term support for independence for Puerto Rico among wider Latin American networks, um, which was of great importance in the 1950s when popular support uh, for nationalism was at rather a low ebb. Though, as Power notes, how much of a low ebb is very difficult to ascertain because of the boycott of elections um, on the issue of nationalism. Nonetheless, the nationalists recognised that some kind of re-engagement with the Puerto Rican population was necessary in the wake of their apparent acceptance of the shift from colony to the so-called free associated state, um, which the nationalists um, portrayed as you know, simply a, an illusion, nothing more than um, a semantic change. This re-engagement, it was decided, should be a renewed arms struggle, and a guerrilla campaign was uh, planned which was meant to lead to a mass uprising on the island, um, and that launch in 1950 was followed by an armed approach to Blair House in Washington by two nationalists, Roselio Torresola and Oscar Caloso, uh, Calasso, sorry, which was interpreted by the guards at least as an attempt on President Truman's life. Um, Torresola was killed and Calasso was arrested. Particularly disturbing for the nationalists, though, was the removal three years later of Puerto Rico in 1953 from the United Nations list of officially designated non-self-governing territories. Um, so not only had the domestic support somewhat crumbled, not only had this initial um, armed venture um, failed to ignite popular support, but the international community support for Puerto Rico was seen to be also crumbling um, in the early 1950s caving into the US demand that Puerto Rico be <coughs> recognised in an international law sense as something of a sovereign entity. Um, it was this change in 1953 that led to the attack <coughs> in Congress a year later by Rafael Cancel Miranda, Andres Figueroa Córdoba, Irving Flores and Lolita Lebron. These violent attacks <coughs> on representatives of US imperial power can be seen as descendants of propaganda of the deed revolutionary violence, um, at least perhaps in strategic terms, in, in terms of inciting popular reaction um, in a period of despair about the building of a mass movement, perhaps. Um, these actions, as far as can be reasonably deduced, were in the nominal service of universalist anti-authoritarian ideals, you know, traditional propaganda of the deed, assassinations and so on, um, where they were undertaken in Europe and the US were carried out against judges, mayors, senators, police, etc. Um, think about in the US the ongoing Gallianist plot to assassinate John D. Rockefeller in the early part of the uh, 20th century, who had just established the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913 when he became a target for Gallianists. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation would go on to play a huge role in acting in place of the US government in public health campaigns in Latin America, and of course had a very con controversial role in sterilization campaigns in Puerto Rico. You know, coincidence, but um, a, a thread nonetheless. While the actions of the Puerto Rican Five, these you know, the four who attacked Congress and the surviving um, putative assassin of Truman, um, went on to become the longest held political prisoners in the US, and their propaganda of the deed obviously didn't uh, create a mass uprising in the sense they perhaps hoped. Those actions were couched in anti-authoritarian terms, you know, harking back to earlier propagandas of the deed. But the focus of their justificatory discourse was much more focused on um, it was it was much more centered on anti-colonialism um, and left nationalism. Um, they weren't anarchists. They weren't against the state in the round. Um, 
and this makes quite a good deal of conjunctural sense. They claimed to be influenced by the contemporaneous Algerian anti-colonial struggle. Um, they later would identify, once in prison, with anti-Vietnam War activists. Um, yet both sets of propaganda of the deed, you know, those of turn of the century anarchists and 1950s Puerto Ricanos, are linked by quite explicit notions of class struggle and violence as a legitimate response to tyranny. You know, there's there's a re frequent references to workers, there's frequent references to um, dictatorial tendencies that they're fighting against. And as Margaret Power has shown, in the 1950s there was a groundswell of international support uh, throughout Latin America for these nationalists and for those ideals. Um, not necessarily all at the same time, so there was, in the narrow sense there was support for the idea of Puerto Rican independence by some elements of um, within the Latin American Solidarity Networks. Um, on the other hand, there were those who recognised that Puerto Rico shared a wider Latin American identity, and that was something to build political solidarity with. And then, going further, there, was, there were those sections of the Latin American left whose politics were rooted in anti-colonialist struggle and reformulating the relationship with the US in colonial, anti-colonial terms. Um, Another lens through which Puerto Rican nationalism has been viewed uh, is that gender, uh, of course, and LeBron in particular has had a gender considered by critics and commentators as well as by academic writers. A uh, Washington Post article looking back at her life uh, in 2004, I think, was titled When Terror Wore Lipstick. Um, and her Time magazine obituary is both deeply feminised and rather infantilising in its reading of her political violence, stating in 2010 that in New York, she found, when she arrived in New York, this is in 1940, <coughs> that she would find a cause so attractive that she was willing to kill and be killed for it, with that romanticised notion burning in her heart and a letter in her pocket that read, my life I give for the freedom of my country, LeBron and three others stormed the house chambers. This gender lens is used to link LeBron's political action with the poetry of Juliana de Burgos and the activism of Luisa Capetillo um, earlier in the century, and here, Josiana Arroyo's article, Living the Political, is particularly um, informative. Um, incidentally, Harris Weinsod has recently published an article detailing the confusing employment history of Juliana de Burgos uh, during the Second World War, a period in which she successively worked for Pueblos Hispanos, the radical cultural journal which argued against US imperialism and for a common Latino political identity, and which was allied to the CPUSA um, under Browder's leadership and then immediately went on to work for the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs under Nelson Rockefeller. Fine has got some interesting interpretations of how that, um, that change was possible within such a short period of time. Um, the Puerto Rican nationalist movement existed within and between two distinct territories, the, the US and Puerto Rico, obviously, um, which themselves had a fairly unique, if no doubt, colonial relationship. Thus, the nationalists were able to draw upon Puerto Ricanos in both territories. It was a New Yorker, for instance, Thelma Mielke, uh, who represented the independence movement at the United Nations. Contextualizing an interview with Lebron, journalist Manuel Roy de Francia noticed, uh, noted that it's a well-held belief amongst Puerto Rican intellectuals that the process of radicalization in the 50s and 60s, i.e. of the nationalist movement, grew out of a reaction to experiences on US soil, not on the island. Um, so the, the influence of the metropolis. Lebron recalled signs in rental accommodation specifying no dogs, no blacks, no Puerto Ricans, which is you know, a twist on the London's no dogs, no blacks, no Irish, famous from the 1970s. Um, and this was actually reflected in a derogatory way by reactions to the attack on Congress back in Puerto Rico, with the theme that Lolita Lebron, a former beauty queen and innocent, had somehow been twisted by her time in New York among the diaspora, so the diaspora were kind of leading her astray. Again, this is why the 1950s is so important to what followed. That diasporic political radicalism was later allied to and informed Chicano and black liberation struggles in the 1960s, obviously tying in with different uh, histories, but with similar conceptions uh, of oppression at the hands of the United States, and particularly the white United States. As Power concludes, the Nationalist Party drew on a common history of Spanish colonialism, a shared sense of being Latin American, and a joint antipathy to US imperialism to build trans-Latin American solidarity with Puerto Rican independence and anti-colonial political prisoners. So it doesn't fit into a lot of standard definitions of transnational activity, of nationalism, or of internationalism. There are elements of all three. Um, I'll move on now 
talk a little bit about Braceros um, and the roots of Mexican American identity. Braceros, literally those lending their arms to the United States, um, were Mexican migrant mer workers operating under a scheme sponsored by both governments and managed by politicians, bureaucrats and law enforcement agents on each side of the border. The Bracero program ran from 1942 to 64, so a little bit either side of the period I'm looking at, um, and was in some ways similar to the German Gastarbeiter system. The scheme was characterised by a vast scope, um, rather contradictory aims and somewhat inconsistent operation, um, depended a lot on the interpretations of um, various officials at various points, and later it became associated with fraud and labour conflict towards um, the end of the 1950s and early 1960s. Between 1948 and 1952, the number of Mexican migrant workers in the US rose from an estimated 70,000 to somewhere in excess of 1.5 million. So it's a very spectacular um, program. In her 2011 book, Braceros, uh, Deborah Cohen reconstructs scenes which seem incredible in the current context of anti-migrant bigotry and institutionalized discrimination across the US Southwest. In 1948, for instance, and again on a larger scale in 1954, the frontier gates were flung open at the behest of US agricultural sector uh, in its hunger for cheap labour. The Mexican government found it extremely difficult to deal with the situation and in the latter case, 1954, resorted to bribery to disperse the crowds of would-be Mexican migrants promising work in northern Mexico along with highly targeted land reform. And highly targeted land reform was essentially you know, land for people who would agree not to go to the US. An, asy asy uh, an asymmetric battle for labour was being fought between an economic powerhouse which at the time could afford to accuse its neighbours of protectionism and an authoritarian regime in Mexico which depended for its legitimacy on the plausible improvement of its subjects' material conditions. Cohen concludes that this scheme resulted in the creation of a transnational proletariat whose subjectivity as workers was grounded in processes and relationships within and outside national boundaries, uh, and also, not only incidentally, vis-à-vis -vis gender and race. So there were all kinds of boundaries being broken down by this scheme, and new links and networks forged in just the way that Marx's sometimes rather gushing descriptions of the power of capitalism sometimes suggest. Not only did the Braceros contribute to the breaking down of national worker identity, creating this transnational space spanning the border where labour circulated frequently, they also caused an increasingly economic nationalist reaction in Californian farm workers unions, which were by this stage often organising in non-Bracero Mexican communities. So while the Braceros were used simultaneously as strike breakers and anti-immigration scapegoats, protected for as long as their labour was useful, uh, but ejected once the crops had been harvested, they were coming into direct conflict and competition with others who identified as Mexican, born the other side of the border. In Trampling Out the Vintage, uh, Frank Bardecker emphasises the material process behind the politicisation of these either-nation Mexicans. Um, for Ch Cesar Chavez, you know, the subject of this book, uh, particularly, politicisation was rooted in the growing mechanisation of agriculture, and that was, you know, the case to some extent um, in Mexico too. But I think it was much more of a spectacular trend um, in the U.S. in the 1950s. Well, earlier, in fact, 40s too. <coughs> Bardecker makes a vivid comparison between the destruction of the Joad homestead in the Grapes of Wrath and the similar flattening of the Chavez farm um, by a tractor in 1939. And the story of the Chavez family during Cesar's youth was that of the failure of the American dream as it specifically applied to Latinos, uh, to Mexican-American um, who didn't yet consider themselves Mexican-American. That identity was not yet in wide currency. Um, instead, as Bardecker puts it, speaking Spanish, living in close contact, uh, contact with new immigrants who had first-hand news from back home, settling in a territory they knew had been taken from Mexico in a war of con conquest, they remained Mexicans and were proud of it. This was then a radical nationalism of a sort, displaced, dispersed, but no less present for existing in its diasporic form. What really tips this on its head, though, is Chavez's work defending local Mexican workers against the downward pressure on wages enforced by migrant Mexican workers on the Bracero program. So Chavez, born in the US, but proudly identifying as Mexican, comes to agitate against Braceros, born in Mexico, but invited to work in the US. Mexican preconceptions about the role of labour activism in an agricultural setting caused some tension with competing US radicalisms. Chavez in particular had a difficult relationship with existing union structures in the late 1950s and suggested that Mexican workers had good reason to be cautious because unions had never done much for farm workers, he said. Um, 
He had developed his organising skills in the anti-communist community service organisation, which though militant, um, you know, in the sense of combating police violence, campaigning for improved public services and some material conditions for workers, nevertheless existed as an alternative and a rival to overtly leftist labour unions. However, other more radical labour traditions had crossed back and forth across the California-Mexico border since the early 20th century. Um, and though the anarchism of the Flores Machon brothers, or you know, pseudo-anarchism depending on how you interpret it, and their associates had faded in the 1920s, Machonismo as a set of militant ideals had been subject to repeated revivals. Bardecker describes notable occasions during which the Machonista heritage was explicitly drawn upon, um, and he mentions the Imperial Valley strikes of the 1920s, the creation of the United Farm Workers in 1962, and the strikes and boycott of 1979, where Machonista or neo Machonistas caused particular problems for Cesar Chavez. And during the period under consideration today, there was a, um, Vardica mentions there was a worker named El Machete, or nicknamed, uh, who claimed the mantle of the Machonista tradition in uh, Southern California and was a well known organiser of Mexican workers who in 1960 directed an unofficial strike which led to the absorption of many Mexican non bracero workers into the United Packing House workers. Um, so this was a, you know, a, a transnational identity, Machonismo, um, albeit one specific to the California-Mexico border somewhat, um, being used in the service of absorption of Mexican workers into a US union. So the transnational condition is important here, but not necessarily indicative or reliably indicative at least not without taking other factors into consideration. While those born in the US Southwest to Mexican parents identified as Mexicans, specifically Mexicans, not yet Mexican-Americans, whether exiles, diaspora, or circulatory transnational population, in this period their common Mexicanidad, or Mexicanidad was trumped by a competition for labor with those actually born in Mexico. Um, and that place of birth becomes quite an important point of contention within this transnational national discourse. Finally, I'd like to consider briefly the role of Mexico as a site of leftist exile. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot has been done on this. There's a conference coming up in Madrid in August um, talking about uh, Mexico as a site of leftist exile, um, I think, the third week of August, um, which looks very interesting on this. Mexico City had been a site of radical exile before, uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, particularly playing host to Tina Madotti, Julio Antonio Mela, Carlton Beals, um, Sandino, uh, and so on. And the 1940s and 1950s saw a return for the city to the status of what Barry Carr calls the Emporium of Revolution. So where previously the Machados and Mela had lived in an old house where Bolivar had once stayed, now Fidel Castro could pastor while Che listened to his plans for Cuban revolution at a house party. Um, Eric Zoloff describes the early Cold War uh, Mexican milieu as a crossroads of the Americas, where Latin America ended or began, and the Anglo-Yankee America loomed menacingly or enticingly. However, Zoloff also finds a breakpoint sometime around the Guatemalan coup, dividing the Mexile, uh, Mexican exile environment into a welcoming open phase and then a hostile, aggressive and interventionist second phase. Pablo Neruda's time as an exiled leftist in Mexico City was during that first open phase, um, when Neruda arrived fleeing the persecution of the Chilean government in 1949. He was only meant to be visiting one country among many in a grand tour, but illness forced him to stay rather longer, and he seemingly developed a strong affinity for Mexico. Canto General was published there in 1950, and Neruda was offered honorary citizenship of Mexico. Um, and there's some conflicts there too, because the, the Chilean communist senator and poet, who, let's not forget, had helped arrange to squirrel Sicairos out of Mexico when in post as a diplomat in 1940, following the first attempt on Trotsky's life, was fated in Mexico at precisely the moment when the Mexican communists had been driven almost out of existence by the Alemán government. How could this contradiction exist? Well, clearly it suited the ruling pre to cultivate its re revolutionary credentials by accepting foreign radicals without exposing Mexicans to their political beliefs, you know, shielded as they were by Article 33 of the Constitution. This is a, a historical commonplace now, and it applies to many of the Spanish exiles arriving during and after the Civil War too. But to this commonplace, I'd like to add that the Mexican left colluded in this contradiction too. And I think Cindy Forster is correct to state um, in Chase Travels that the left in Latin America and the Caribbean has always been intensely internationalist. But in Mexico's case, this internationalism 
played a peculiar role, and one which I would like to explore in other national lefts throughout Latin America too. Um, my doctoral research suggested that, at least in the years following the Second World War, a near consensus existed on the left in Mexico, utilising Marxist categorizations and definitions, but concentrating on imperialism and colonialism rather than domestic socio-economic concerns. Um, and this consensus was constantly reinforced, not by marginalising or obscuring internationalist aspects of leftist discourse, far from it in fact, um, but by detaching them entirely from the Mexican domestic political situation. And to put that a bit more simply, Mexican political and economic elites were held to far lower standards than those elsewhere uh, by the Mexican left. Uh, and the Mexican left weren't ill-informed about global events. They were, the, you know, Mexican communist newspapers were full of stories from communist China, Korea, and so on. They were, um, you know, Greece, Turkey. Um, but the same rhetoric, the same um, class analysis was not applied to the situation in Mexico. As an example, in his 1944 pamphlet, uh, What are the Urgent Tasks of the Peoples of Latin America? Vicente Lombardo Toledano made sweeping condemnations of both Latin America's traditional dictatorships and its clerical fascism, uh, the latter describing the Argentine government at the time, while fulsomely praising the achievement of national unity uh, and, indeed, going further, the unity of all patriotic Mexicans under Avila Camacho in Mexico. <coughs> Overlooking the many strikes which had defied the 1942 Labour Unity Pact, Lombardo proclaimed that Avila Camacho had won the outright support of the proletariat. This is just one example from other research I've undertaken. But for Mexico, I'll certainly argue that the domestic left's internationalism had a dual function. Shouted loudly, and I'm sure earnestly, it did good leftist work, but it made for a distinctly easier relationship with the domestic government. In other words, it was internationalism but at the service of hegemonic nationalism. Um, but I don't, won't go into that much further here. It taps into another strand of my work um, and an article that I've got in for review at the moment. And to be fair to Earl Browder, who I'm very disparaging of in my thesis, and the World War II era CPUSA, they were strongly critical of the colonial status of Puerto Rico, and they were very consistent about that, um, relatively consistent across national boundaries. It was in this period, famously then, that the Castros made contract, uh, contact with Che Guevara, no contract, as far as I'm aware, while in Cindy Forster's chapter in Chase Travels, we encounter the Guevara whose body of ideas was shaped during his long involuntary unemployment in Guatemala. It was nonetheless his enforced journey to Mexico City which precipitated the meeting with Raul and later Fidel. And I think Fidel's nationalism at this point was fairly consciously transnational, building on common links with other Latin American radicalisms um, influenced by Jose, Mart Jose Martí, who was mentioned uh, fairly frequently, choosing organisational sites where borders were porous, usefully porous, um, and political contacts were, were possible. One perhaps surprising element of these transnational networks is that they didn't necessarily include many communists, or party communists. Um, but here the pre-existing links between on the one hand the Cuban Communist Party and the Batista regime, and on the other hand the Cuban and the Mexican Communist Parties are relevant. And as such it's not too surprising to find Castro engaging in some sort of a rapprochement with the Autentico tradition uh, who were advocating, or some of whom were advocating violent revolt against Batista, while relations with the communists from Cuba who had attacked Castro on a number of occasions remained poor. What's more, even if the Mexican <coughs> Communist Party is set aside as conservative or moribund during the 1950s, uh, while other more vibrant lefts did exist, and here one can look at Tanalis Padilla's work on the Jaramillistas, at the Enriquista movement, uh, at the POCM, and even possibly, as Zorov suggests, at the Partido Popular, although again I'm very disparaging about Lombardo Toledano in my thesis, <laughs> those active lefts were not particularly engaged with transnational activism, uh, with internationalist concerns, or with solidarity on behalf of other left nationalisms necessarily. Um, there were many proclamations in favour of global peace and the big global peace campaigns, um, but not necessarily strong agitation on behalf of radical uh, nationalism. And though I wouldn't go quite as far as Renato Keller in stating that these other lefts were not yet connected to the global Cold War, I agree to the extent that they were not actively and self-consciously connected to those conflicts. However, as objects of Cold War repression, uh, as well as some negotiation and co-optation, I think they were nevertheless very much part of this endogenous early Cold War. There's plenty of locally grown communism and anti-communism and the, the struggle between in Latin America uh, in this period. 
And the Cuban revolutionaries made other links too. Um, briefly, you know, Jose Antonio Echeverria of the Directorio Revolucionario, for one, um, who would go on to announce his three minutes of truth, or at least the first few seconds of the three minutes of truth, on the radio during the uprising of the 13th of March 1957. And the 13th of March became an iconic and contentious date within the constructed revolutionary chronology, contentious largely because of the Directorio's uncertain or tense relationship with Castro and his compañeros, notwithstanding its later metamorphosis, um, or perhaps more accurately, rebirth as an avowedly anti-Castro exile organisation. At the time, uh, Echeverria's revolutionary pronouncement made waves internationally, not only in Cuba, Latin America, but went as far abroad as the Soviet Union and Vietnam, where it was lionised and turned into poetry. Um, so, not so much a conclusion section as a series of further questions, um, I'm afraid. Was this a distinct phase of transnational political activism, uh, of collaboration, of internationalist nationalism? Or was this part of a longer story that should include US communists heading south to Mexico in the 1930s, as well as the revolutionary explosions of the 1960s? Um, do we need these breakpoints? Do we need the special periodization? Uh, or is that historiographical, uh, historiographical lack um, not relevant to these historical processes at all? And to address the key point of the book idea, why does this period matter? Well, that is a question that I would like to try and answer, albeit in a slightly glib way. We all know why the post-1959 period is so crucial. Um, it's, it's fairly self-evident, I think. But in the 1945 to 1959 period, we find, I think, the grandparents of all those better-known strands of leftism that explode in the 1960s and the 1970s and beyond, in fact. And they are grandparents that don't get on particularly well, perhaps, but whose ideological and organisational descendants would go on to shape discourse, and in some cases, politics and society, um, throughout Latin America. And I'll finish up there.